Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Career Diaries by Elamed, the podcast dedicated to talking about careers in the medtech industry. And today I have Tom Melvin with me, someone who's had a very extensive career, who has more recently moved into academia, but who has been known for his big experience in the Irish Competent Authority. So, Tom, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Um, thanks, Selena. Um, so, yeah, uh, Tom Melvin's my name. I, I work a, as an academic, as you mentioned. Um, I'm an associate professor in medical device regulatory affairs at Trinity College Dublin. And I guess my main job is um, acting as a director of new masters in science. So, um, I guess I do a little bit of lecturing now. It's going to start quite intensively from September. And I guess the other part of my job then is doing research. So um, with a lot of people who I used to work with as a regulator and lots of new people doing research into the regulatory system. So really, really interesting to hear that you've like recently just pivoted now into, into academia. So so how did you how did you get into regulation? <laughs> yeah, it was not planned, not at all planned. Um I guess it was about eight years ago um, and I was 29. Um, I was working as a junior doctor. So I'd done what in Ireland you call as your basic specialist training. And then you go and specialize into an area like cardiology or endocrinology or or whatever. Um, So I had to decide what specialty I wanted to go into, but um, I wasn't quite sure. And there was a few things that I liked, um, things like um, gerontology or medicine for the elderly um, actually spent about two years working in that and found it really interesting. We didn't think going into it I would, but uh, found it really nice. Um, but essentially, I took a year out. Um, I was supposed to go to South America, and I was saving up doing some locum work um, because it's quite well paid to do short-term contracts. And um, I was going to save up for about two or three months and then travel for the rest of the year. Um, but I guess the agency who was arranging the locums for me said they had this interesting job um, And it required kind of, uh, you have to be a medical doctor, but it also valued things like engineering or law. And before medicine, I studied law um, and would have worked as a legal executive. So I didn't formally qualify, but I worked in a solicitor's office um, every summer. Um, And I guess because of that, they kind of pushed me in the door of the Irish authority into HPRA. I didn't really know what HPRA was. I thought they kind of approved everything. I didn't know what notified bodies were. Yeah. Uh, so the interview was a little patchy, <laughs> um, but uh, I guess they must have seen something in me because they offered me the job and uh, I started then in HPRA as what they call a medical officer. So you're a medical doctor who does work on you know clinical trials and medical devices in the post-market. And then uh, over the seven years I was in HPRA, I went from a medical officer to being what they call a senior medical officer and I had some uh, management responsibilities. So um, that was my journey into regulation. It was very unplanned and unintended. But um, once I got in and saw the first couple of files that came to my desk, um, I was hooked. Uh, it was wow. it was incredibly interesting to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Um, and it became kind of a running joke with my wife. Um, you know, it, she'd always see me leaving at four in the morning to fly to here or there in Europe. And she'd be like, where are you going what are you doing? What are you talking about? It's always the same. It's always medical devices. Um, and I kind of became a, a monomaniac for medical devices and how the clinical evidence rules work. Because in an authority, you get to see it's something of a false sample. You see all the bad things that happen. You can see the truly um, you know, significant public health impacts that can happen when things go wrong. Um, and, you know, that and meeting, you know, I privilege to meet some of the patients whose lives are affected by devices with safety challenges. That kind of became my motivation to see, you know, how can we make this system better? So and and and, and I've seen you talk on this on this topic. And, and I know that this is something that you're, you're super passionate about. Um, and uh, I really want to dig into and learn, learn what I can about what it was uh, like to actually work on a competent authority side. But before we go there, I want to just rewind to something that you said earlier on in your explanation where you said did you say you studied law so you wanted to be a lawyer but then you ended up being being a doctor so how, how did that come yeah. about yeah yeah um well exactly when I left uh, secondary school or, or high school or, or whatever it's called and wherever people are listening um I thought law sounded interesting um but again <laughs> it's been something of a trait to a huge amount of research Uh, When I was in secondary school, I was a science geek. So like I was doing physics and maths, Olympiads and uh, 
I was very much into the science rather than the arts and humanities side of the thing. But once I started studying law, I found it really interesting. Um, not so much studying legal precedent. You know, in Ireland and the UK, a huge amount of the study of law is looking at previous decisions that courts made and looking at those legal precedents and seeing a judge said that and gave these reasons here. So what might we do with the you know thing that's presenting to me with this client? Um, I didn't find that so interesting, but I liked looking at how things like uh, systems work. So I got really interested in world trade rules, um, which is a kind of a very abstract thing to get interested in, because at the time, there was a move from something called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade to the World Trade Organization. And there was a huge movement through the 90s to liberalize trade, get rid of what economists call technical barriers to trade. And believe it or not, it is quite relevant to the medical device sector because that's where our laws came from as well. You know, these regulations that we've been updating with MDR, they started in the 90s as a movement to get rid of technical barriers to trade and get us the single market that's now 30 years old. Um, so I got really interested in essentially complex systems and seeing how does that work to try and get the most fair outcome for you know a public interest or people generally. Um, and I kind of found when I was um, thinking of becoming a lawyer, a lot of my friends were doing science disciplines and medicine, and I found it really interesting. The basic difference was when you're a doctor and you have to do something, there's a cardiac arrest, you have to know every single intervention in the what you need to do as things change and you need to have that at top of mind and ready to go immediately and it was a great combination of knowledge and also practical skills and i found that in law um when a client came and asked you a question you'd write down all of the background to their issue but then you'd have to go and research it was really hard to build a working memory of knowledge that meant you could solve their problems uh you know, on first principles, you almost always had to go and do further research or send a briefing to a, a barrister or whatever. So I really liked the part of medicine that meant you had to keep on top of your knowledge because you had to apply that instantly in a really complex, changing, often high pressure uh, situation. Um, and when I saw that's what my medicine friends were doing, I thought, I don't want to do that. That sounds really cool. Um, so then I finished, I did a degree and a master's in law um, and during my master's, I started going back to studying science because you had to do this great big thing called the, forget what it was called, it was an aptitude test, GAMSAT, to get into medicine. And it required kind of a kind of a first year bachelor of science kind of level of knowledge. So I had to go back whilst I was doing my dissertation in law, go back into science and relearn a lot of things and uh, to get in. Um, and then, yeah, that was a pretty big career uh, handbrake turn. So would you say that you've had sort of like a typical career journey? <laughs> no, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, it, and it's probably somewhat reflective in med tech where, um, you know, people, you don't go to train in reg and quality affairs or a lot of the people currently working in the sector came from many different places. But yeah, I, I guess when um, I was uh, studying law, um, but becoming sort of less interested in going and pursuing a career in it. Um, I kind of did just become naturally more interested in science and, you know, seeing the application of science, you know, you have to keep a lot of knowledge as well as, you know, the art of medicine. I found that a really interesting kind of profession. Um, so that was kind of the big driver that led me to pivot out of the humanities kind of subject and back into a, a scientific one. And what made you decide to sort of move away from, you know, being like present doctor in the hospital to actually move in? Because I know you said that the opportunity sort of arose, but that's, mm. again, like a really big career shift, isn't it? Going from like being in the hospital with the patients on the front yeah. lines, you know, uh, in the trenches to more of sort of like a role where you're acting more in regulation as you did when you moved into HPRA. What made you make that decision? Yeah, I, did. I remember they asked me that at the interview. Um and I think I was very honest at the time because I wasn't particularly bothered if I got the job or not. I was not, <laughs> you know, I would have gone to South America. It'd be a very different life. But um, <laughs> I guess it was quite flippant. Uh, over was, on a beach. Uh, basically, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the answer I, I gave to him in the interview was that, um, you know, I, I'd kind of developed a really big interest in public health. Um, and, you know, coming from having studied complex systems and seeing how it affects real people, I realized that 
Um, and I guess a lot of it came from doing things like doing electives, going to places like Africa or, or Vietnam and seeing when health systems are poor, um, you know, you're really not empowering doctors to do the best for patients generally. Um, and you really need to strengthen health systems. And that's a really complicated job. But I realized that if you can be impactful in a public health sense, you can get more done for the public interest than you might ever in a lifetime of going around a hospital. Mm. Um, and I guess that helps give me the motivation to think that, um, you know, there's an opportunity here to do some good. Um, I guess there was that, as well as the fact that one of the challenges in Ireland with medicine is that you basically, it takes 10 years to go and become fully qualified. So at the point I was at, it was about sort of three years in, but I would have about another 10 years of training, which in Ireland means they send you to a hospital here and a hospital there and, and everywhere else. And I guess because I was a mature student going into medicine, um, you know, moving town and moving across the country and these kind of things were less uh, <laughs> undesirable. If I was younger, I probably wouldn't have been so tough, but uh, kind of gotten settled in Dublin and wasn't too keen to be moving around every six months. And it was the time of your life when you, you know, are thinking about, you know, you might at some point settle down or have children. And it's a real challenge. You know, a lot of my friends who are still doctors and are now completed that training or there or thereabouts, it, it's been a real challenge for them, as, you know, with the struggles of life as well as having to move and work in different places. So because of those practical quality of life things, as well as seeing a, a good merit in it, and then once I got in, I went into the job thinking, I'll try it for a couple of months and it works, it works, doesn't, it doesn't, no, no problem. Um, but like I said, I kind of caught a bug very quickly when I saw some of the technologies, you know, some of the testing that was done to rationalize it going into humans um, was sometimes pretty surprising. And I realized there's a lot of potential we can do to improve things here. Yeah, it seems like that that purpose. My, my brother's a doctor. He's a junior doctor in the NHS. Um, and I've heard, you know, I've heard the stories and I know how tough it is because you are literally moving every few months, different hospitals, you know, you're, 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 you're constantly studying and like constantly having to learn and be on top of everything. And the pressures are really immense, but something that I've seen with my brother, because, you know, I, I always say to him, why not pursue a career in the medical device industry? Um, <laughs> it's, it's that it seems like doctors, you know, there's this big sense of purpose, you know, and this big sense of like this real big sense of wanting to do good in the world. And I'm not saying if you're not a doctor, you don't have that, but it's it seems to be a real driver for why people go into medicine and why they want to be doctors. And that's, you know, that's coming through strongly when, when you're talking as well, that sense of purpose and being able to have that big impact. But, and it's really interesting to see how you you were able to still see the impact that you could have even if you're not, you know, on the front line with patients in a role as a regulator, the wider impact that you can have, the good that you can actually do is still really, really big. So so now I want to get into talking a little bit about your experience at HPRA. So mm -hmm. spill the beans, spill the beans, Tom. Um, expectations versus reality. So how did it compare to what you were expecting when you started working in HPRA to actually what it was like to work in HPRA? Yeah, well... Because I, I'd never done any kind of regulatory job at all before. And uh, the only time I worked in an office was as a legal executive or legal assistant or whatever you want to call it. Um, having been doing 80 hours a week, running around the hospital, um, you know, being exhausted, just being able to sit in an office and go home at like four or five in the afternoon, that to me was a culture shock. Like I, I can't even tell you. By the end of the you know afternoon, I'd be like, I can just go now. Uh, you know, it was um, it was incredible. It took me probably a good six months to realize uh, how and the amount of free time that you had. You know, when I think back now, it was amazing. Um, so, uh, so I guess the those that was the biggest shock for me going from working in a frenetic uh, clinical environment into you know office hours and and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of what it's like working in a, a regulatory authority. Um, I remember reading a, a careers guidance book for uh, doctors once and it kind of went through all of the things you could end up working in. And there's, you know, outside of hospital medicine, there's all kinds of places uh, medical doctors can end up. And I remember seeing it had just a little line on being a regulator and whoever wrote the book must have just found a regulator and gotten the impression that these are incredibly busy people because they basically said, you'll be very, very busy. <laughs> 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 it, it is kind of the case that, um, you know, when you go in and you get trained in and know how to run the procedures for whatever you're doing, 
you will often become very busy very quickly. Um, and that's the nature of working in the public service in a lot of cases. You know, they're not, they're rarely overly resourced and they're often quite minimally resourced and it becomes a very uh, active job of managing cases at different time periods and different places. So I guess you have to be able to deal with a lot of detail um, and kind of manage your time to get the necessary things done and prioritize things. That's one side of it. But I guess the other side working in authority on medical device stuff is that it's very cross-disciplinary. So on any one day, you're dealing with engineers, toxicologists, you know, all kinds of different scientific disciplines, lawyers and policy people, um, you know, what regulators call stakeholders, the people whose uh, you know, decisions affect, you know, industry, clinicians, hospitals, all these kind of people. So um, depending on the nature of the case that you'd have, and working in clinical was a great one because you were, you know, so horizontally pulled into all kinds of things that happen with devices. So the stuff an authority does is, you know, they do some things pre-market for trials of new devices, and then they do more stuff in the post-market for the things we call market surveillance and vigilance. And usually clinical would be called in when there was a, you know, often a difficult challenge in terms of a safety issue. Um, but you got exposed to all of the different work across the department. So it was a really nice one in that way. Um, but you have to have a very keen eye for detail. You have to be able to manage, you know, you know what I guess the Harvard Business Review would call busy work. Um, there's going to be a lot of small little things that come your way and then sometimes big things. Um, being able to manage all that and not getting too stressed out by it um, is important. And good communication is absolutely vital because, you um, so much of the work is complicated. So I used to really enjoy talking to patients um, because it made you have to understand the regulations enough that you could explain it in plain English to someone so that they understood. Because a lot of the time, your average patient or citizen thinks that the regulator can just swipe a pen and make everything go away. And explaining to them that, well, in this complicated regulatory system we have in Europe, our role is to do these parts of it and we can't swipe our pen and fix all of the problems that we might be talking about now that will require this and this and this. And that made me really good at communicating. And medicine itself was brilliant for that as well because you have to explain complicated you know, diagnoses and treatment options to people. Um, so there's kind of a lot of natural learning there, but um, communication is absolutely vital um, you know, to do well on the authority side. You know. Really, really interesting. You said that earlier on, you said that like you had the chance to see the impacts on patients or you had the chance to speak to patients. What story like particularly sticks in your mind when you look back? Oh, um, there's, there's lots. And believe it or not, it's, a, it's not an easy thing to talk about because I guess some of these things, you know, in the rules that we apply for device regulation, a lot of these interactions would probably fall under some form of Article 20 of the directives or it would be commercially confidential. So there's probably legal constraints on going into too much detail. But, um, you know, in general, one of the good things that HPRA did is that they were very open to talking to patients or patient representative groups. Um, and over the years in Ireland, we've had a number of quite high profile medical device safety issues. So you know, in 2018, for example, our chief medical officer in Ireland decided to ban all surgery involving transvaginal mesh. Um, mm. And those products, yeah. the variety of them, there's different surgical subtypes, and some of them have bigger safety issues than others. Um, but simply looking at the evidence and looking at what a registry might say in terms of a high rate of certain safety outcomes, that'll give you a certain impression of the nature of the problem. But when you go and talk to one of the women impacted by this problem and they tell you about the impact it has on their quality of life, their home life and personal life and these kind of things, um, it gives you a much more clear eyed impression of the true human impact. And as a regulator, that's something that you really have to go out and try and find whenever you can, because you could just look at numbers and say, well, if we tip over this rate of things, then we can go and have a benefit risk determination conversation. You've probably heard that at many, many conferences. But if you want to have a true benefit risk determination impression, you need to understand what's happening to the patients on the ground. And often that's about access to surgeons, access to hospitals, access to the remediation services, and all of those things that a regulator has basically nothing to do with. But you need to understand that context to understand what you need to go and do then as a regulator. 
Um, so it's absolutely vital. And, you know, it, it is those interactions that I was privileged to have that basically leave the fire in my belly for going off and improving parts of the system where it necessarily the discussions be, become more abstract because you're dealing with things on a, a meta type level. But it is from the very real world examples that you see that that keeps the motivation. Yeah, no, that's that sounds um, that sounds like it makes sense as well, though, right? Like, because otherwise you're just looking at data, aren't you? Essentially, yeah. and uh, and actually speaking to patients, they're telling you their story. It reminds me of the Netflix documentary. I wrote a blog on it as well when it when it came out years ago. Um, what was it called? The Bleeding Edge, and uh, yeah. they used this. Yeah, they used this example, and they did take a lot of like these real world scenarios, right? They had people there talking about the impacts that this had actually had on their lives. And, uh, you know, there's no denying that in cer- certain circumstances, it was re- really horrific, you know, the impact that that it, it had, had had on people. How do you keep the balance, though? So when you're having these highly emotive conversations um, and you're 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 seeing the, the the real impact that it has on one particular person, but then surely there needs to be a moment where the data does have some influence. It does have to be like a certain number, you know, but then when you're having these emotive conversations, surely that's that's not that it's leading to bias, but how do you navigate that? Yeah. Yeah. There's two parts to that I think that are probably important in terms of the stuff I, I kind of work on these days. I, I guess the first is, you know, what is that level? What is yeah. that level indeed? You know, um, in our regulatory system, you need to have a positive overall benefit risk determination, meaning in general, more patients are left better off than might be worse off. Um but that's not a uh, defined standard in a clinical evidence sense. And it's one of those key differences between the worlds of devices and drugs. Um, With drugs, you have to demonstrate safety and efficacy. And because of tragedies in the drug world, things like sulfonidamide and thalidomide over the years, they increase the clinical trial methodology requirements. So, you know, you always hear, and you've probably heard this at plenty of conferences, the need for the double-blind randomized controlled trials in the drug world. And we can't have double-blind randomized controlled trials for devices for a variety of reasons. But we do need clear methodology because it can't just be that one company might think we might have tipped into negative benefit risk territory here. We need to really have rules when it matters uh, so that all devices are aware of when you're getting into bad safety territory and what are the kind of safety actions that need to be taken and you know removing a product from the market is the highest order of action and yeah. um, there's a huge amount then you know the typical work of regulation happens below that so it's within you know issuing field safety notices to the market or changing labeling or controlling the use population and those kinds of things um but i guess that's one side of it how do we get that methodology better um and I, I guess the other side of it then, when we're thinking about these challenging emotive issues, is that, um, you know, I was talking, I was asked to talk with a core MD project, it's one I'm involved with uh, in Europe, about the history of regulatory science and, and medical devices. Um, and there's a book that I've been reading, a, a lady, Susan Bartlett Foote, she does a great deep dive on the history of med tech in the United right. States over the past hundred years or so. Um and, you know, she lays it out very clearly that all regulatory agencies are creatures of the political process um, mm. and all public institutions in some sense are. Um, and therefore, oftentimes we have a crisis model of regulatory improvement. Um, and if you look at the history of device regulation or the history of health product regulation, you see that come true all the time. Like we've done well to make it this far into this conversation without mentioning the PIP breast implants. Yeah, again. I was and literally just going to go there. And... <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have a drinking game every time it's mentioned. But um, you know, that but that truly is how regulatory systems improve because it, that's often the only time you'll get to influence a politician who has the power to make an architectural change to the system. Mm. Um, and between those pillars. Um, we have to try and get the science as good as we can, you know, with the methodology. Often you're talking in an abstract kind of sense, but it does truly help reduce the risk that you'll get one of those crises in future. Um, yeah, that's that's the kind of space where I spend a, a, quite a bit of time these days. So, so what changes? So you've spoken a little bit about the changes and how regulation comes about, and uh, the difference between sort of like devices and drugs. Um, so, what what major changes have you seen happen or are happening right now in terms of like the evolution of in particular regulations around 
medical devices and diagnostics. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting, uh, having just come back from that IMDRF meeting, um, you know, with worldwide regulators and getting to talk to lots of people who I, I didn't get to see in a while. Um, you know, I was really impressed by some of the emerging economies. You know, they have the African Medical Device Forum now, where they're developing, you know, med tech rules often for the first time and coming together. And, you know, their challenges are very different to looking at things like maternal and child health and devices to support those aspects with our public health, you know, need significant improvement. Um, and I think that it really struck me that when you're developing regulations for the first time, it's kind of like building a new house on a clear plot of land. And it's great. There's enthusiasm and excitement. Um, what we're doing in Europe is we had a house that we built in the early 1990s. It took us about 10 years to move into it. Um, and then we decided to kind of renovate that house whilst living in it. <laughs> um, and that's a much more frustrating job to do um, and I think that when you look at it broadly um, we're starting to deal with some of those frustrations now we've bought ourselves more time um, but I guess there's going to be an essential tension um, as things go on uh, there are so many different technologies that are not just um, different in terms of the, where the implant goes but it's you know, groundbreakingly different artificial intelligence, yeah. the large language models like ChatGPT that it can percolate their way into clinical practice and, and uh, you know, for sure will. Um, how do we keep a set of market access rules with CE marking and overall benefit risk that can accommodate these, you know, profoundly distinct products in terms of how you might look after their essential safety and, and how they should work? Um, so I guess, you know, where we're coming from, we've kind of remedied our structure to an extent, and we're still bedding that in. There's a lot of regulatory infrastructure that's not fully operational yet or is just starting to come into effect. Um, so that's going to be the dynamic for quite a while. But then at the same time, we have to keep up with the technologies. And again, it reminds me of the kind of looking back over the last kind of 100 years of device regulation. You know, we had pacemakers 30 years before we had any rules for pacemakers on a European basis. And some, some member states kind of realized that. And for some products, they'd kind of chuck them into their drug laws um, and they'd call them non-drugs and regulate them with you know drug type regulation. There was kind of an intuitive learning there and, and some member states. Um, but yeah, I guess trying to deal with these very different technologies is going to be the, the number one challenge. Yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because like regulation sort of follows innovation in that sense. Um, yeah. Because... Uh, you're sort of following what's happening and then you have to it's, it the way i see it looking at it from the outside is almost like but with regulation you're always trying to kind of keep up you know with like what's going on um and it's really interesting to see how this is all going to play out with ai and just the whole digital space because it it evolves at such a rapid rate and you know i've been in recruitment for 11 years now and mdr has been sort of like a big part of what i've been following hence why i've got the group but the, the pace at which like it's actually happened with kicking the can down the road and giving it more time you know when you look on the other side of like an explosion like chat gpt and what that does to the world when something like that comes out it's going to be really interesting to see how regulation is going to go about um managing that in the future um mm. i don't know if you've got any thoughts on that um you know i guess just a very general one would be that the rules that we got for what now cover these products started as trade rules so like I, I mentioned it was about getting a single market in the sort of Thatcherite and Reagan era of getting single markets getting rid of barriers to trade and having um you know the most free trade being the economical way of getting us the most efficient system um and that makes sense from an economic perspective but when we come to healthcare it, there's always an essential challenge there and I guess we'll have to see on a European basis, I think one of the challenges you see when we try to better regulate these technologies, we add things in as further layers on top of existing regulation. Um, but I, I guess it could be more rational to try and carve out and just regulate differently mm. some of the technologies like AI. You know, it's something where it's, it's not at all the way the commission are going. I think they're going to add layers on. So you'll have the MDR that will cover AI algorithms, but then you'll have the artificial intelligence regulation that will cover all AI you know, for a medical purpose or other purpose. Um, but that kind of layering approach, 
can make it technocratically really challenging to work your way through. And that might be okay when you have a small number of players in something like the AI market. And it's probably not that small as there's lots of players. But when yeah. you look to something like, you know, the digital health and health and wellness app, you know, marketplace, we have 350,000 health apps across the Google Play and Apple App Store. Um, and how many of them are medical devices and how many of them are regulated appropriately as such? Um, I don't think anyone knows. Um, so when you have these complex layers, it's really hard then to try and bring the sector into compliance because when you sit down with software people and say, you'll have to comply with these parts of MDR and do your risk class, get a notified body, then be aware of the AI Act and then keep in mind the European health data space that's coming and, and this and this and this and this, um, you can very easily lose them. Um, and it could be hard to rein in a market then. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that's a, a real challenge. How do you have regulation that is is tailor-made to the sector you know when they first started with devices the reason we had an active implantable directive before the general medical device directive is because there was somewhere in mind they were thinking of doing technology focused directives oh really so it's active implantable and then maybe do another type of like hips or cardiovascular or something and that would have set the tone for much more discreet rules than that are targeted to the technology um, but instead, we have very generic rules, and we have to find a good way to create predictability within them. Um, and that's probably the more likely way it will go, but that's no easy job. Mm, yeah, very, very difficult, especially when you have various different stakeholders and your, you know, various different markets. So where do you see, so where do you see regulation going in the future? Yeah, um, well, in, in the, we're going to be dealing with MTR until 2028. Um and that will have left us, you know, I think the first <laughs> yeah, the first discussions for MDR started in 2008. So yeah. we've had a 20 year transitionary timeline um, and regulations always have to be updated. But, you know, I suspect when we get to 2028 um, and the commission will be reporting to parliament, I think in 2027, you know, what are they going to recommend? Um, it's something of an open question. And you often hear people increasingly talk about the European Medicine Agency and yeah. the mission creep that might be there. Um, in terms of where things might go beyond the transition timeline, it's, I think it's right now, it's kind of hard to predict. But in terms of where I'd like to see things go, again, it's along that line of helping us to get better methodology that matches the technologies and the public health risks that are attached to them. Um, and you're very right in the decentralized system we have, where there's notified bodies, authorities, manufacturers, patient groups, clinicians, and on and on and on and on. Um, we need to find a good way to get agile, adaptive, technology-focused rules. So I was for a long time, um, when I try and sit down and explain myself to academics and researchers and things now, for a long time, I was going around like a kind of clinical science evangelist, going to lots of meetings saying, we should be using clinical science to help our problems here to make them, you know, market access more predictable and more obvious to developers. Um, but one of the challenges on the regulatory side is that it's often a far more technocratic process procedural um, mindset that there is. Um, so it's very hard to get science in to give more predictable rules because people were often far more comfortable or content with simply interpreting what the law says. And when you expand the volume of the law, as we did with MDR, where it's 10 times bigger, um, the, there's a lot of necessary interpretation that has, has to work. But I think sometimes we need to worry less about what the law says and just use that as the boundaries to work within, but then open the space for good clinical science, because that's where you'll get predictable and proportionate rules. Um, and we kind of need to do that in Europe. You know, there's lots of signals from questionnaires you know medtech europe the boston consulting group and ucla and all these people have done questionnaires to industry and that old dynamic of europe being the innovation friendly first launch market um that does seem to be changing no one's quite sure the extent to which it's changed but from multiple questionnaires and from those kind of anecdotal reports it seems to be changing significantly um i hope that it doesn't change so much too late that as regulators, when we want to try and fix that, that the tide will have shifted too far away. Mm. Um, we really do need to have clinical science and technology focused rules. And I think common specifications of these things in MDR that can really help do that. Um, 
and hopefully we'll get to a place where there'll be better development of them. You know, I, you can see um, from some of the work that's ongoing in European projects now, and hopefully in some future projects, getting people together to work on that. I think that'll be absolutely vital. Um, but yeah, I guess that's hopefully where it'll go, more technology focused, but you can never predict. Um, and and so talk to me a little bit about what you're what you're up to now then, this new role in academia, being a professor. Uh, what what are you teaching now? What are you lecturing on? Yeah, uh, well, I guess right now, I guess a lot of teaching I, I do is to support um, courses and things like biomedical engineering or in the School of Medicine. Um, so I guess helping people who are doing kind of allied topics um, to understand medical device regulation. Um, but starting next September, um, we'll hopefully launch the uh, a two-year part-time master's in science, and it's focused entirely on medical device regulatory affairs. Um, so I guess what I'll be doing as my main job um, for probably the next well over a year, maybe two years, is getting that course created and bedding it in and, and bringing it through its first student cohort. Um, and it's really interesting because I get to challenge myself to go off and you know, prepare session materials on things related to risk management and quality management and things that when I was a regulator and just being the, the clinical people and the clinical team, other people often looked at the risk management file, you know, often the scientific officers or engineers and then would come to us with, you know, discrete questions based on it. So it's really good for me to go back into these things and figure out how do we teach them to people with maybe some experience of med tech, but haven't maybe worked in regular quality affairs before. Um, so it's really enjoyable trying to tease those things out as well as supporting research either with people who are undergraduates or postgraduates or PhDs. Um, you know, it's really striking moving to a university because everyone there is just incredibly um, you know, passionate about the research they're doing. They want to learn. They're incredibly keen. Um, and it's just really impressive to see the amount of work that they do and do quickly and to a really high quality standard. Um, it's just been inspirational to see that um, and having the opportunity now to kind of help to shape research um, and to build kind of research communities. Um, it's really fantastic because I've kind of, I found my tribe <laughs> and we're building my tribe a little bit. But <laughs> it's, it's, it's really uh, good, positive work. Yeah. Well, congratulations on getting the masters uh, masters off the ground as well. How can people find out about it? Like, can anybody sign up? Yes. Uh, so there is a web page. Uh, we have a brochure, um, okay. and they can just email me, uh, okay. <laughs> or or find me on LinkedIn or whatever. Um, we'll hopefully run a webinar in the next while. Um, we kind of gave it a, a reasonably soft launch. Um, as soon as the brochure was ready, we shared it. But hopefully, we left some more um, promotional material and background material. Um, as well as a student handbook to kind of explain some of the more practical aspects around the course. Um, so there's more to follow, but I guess there is information on the web page and the brochure, and anyone interested can contact me and we can uh, sign them up for the webinar that we'll be doing. But, um, yeah. Brilliant. Well, I think that, you know, that's that's a new a new journey for you, isn't it? And it's it's very topical, and I'm sure there's going to be loads of people interested um, that, that are going to reach out. And um, I have one final question for you, Tom, because it's been a fascinating conversation. We've gone big picture. We've gone detail. We've spoken about regulation. We've spoken about HPRA. But, you know, as somebody who, you know, is is clearly driven by that bigger purpose, um, the question I love to ask everybody is, what is the legacy that you want to leave on the world? Oh, um, well, you know, I suppose by... Um, trying to contribute with the best possible research outputs to get the best informed policy development. Um, you know, we talked about some of the ways that regulation might go in the future and some of the real um, you know, public health importance of that. Um, so I'm passionate about trying to get the best research that will make sure that the regulators have the best tools or the best information available to hand to help them make the best decisions when they get to design parts of the system and implement some of the new parts of it. Um, so I guess on the research side, that's what I'm passionate about. And on the education side, it's it's really is truly inspirational to get to work with people with a keen interest in the topic and help shape where they go with their research. Um, that's just really nice work to have a privilege to do. And I feel very you know lucky and privileged to be able to do that work as well. Tom, it's been really good to chat. Really good to chat and hear your story. I mean, I, I sort of knew your story, but it's been fascinating hearing about it in more detail. And I'm really excited for this next step for you and this master's and the impact that you're that you're clearly going to have 
um, you know, on the on the wider world. So thank you for joining me on this session. Thank you. Uh, it was fantastic. It was great to talk with you. Hopefully it wasn't too scary. <laughs> <laughs> Not easily scared. And, uh, and, and to everybody listening, don't forget to give this a thumbs up, give it a like, write a comment and stay tuned for the next episode of Career Diaries by Elamed coming soon. Thank you, Tom. Have a good day. Thank you. How's that? Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're like a, a, a med tech Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep that. I'm going to keep that in. <laughs>